Hello, this is Mike Swanson, and this is a segment of the Past American Century. Got a very special guest with me today with some pretty groundbreaking information, and that's Carmine Savastano. He's the author of the book Two Princes and a King and runs the Neapolis uh, Media Group. How are you doing today, Carmine? I'm doing good, Mike. Thanks for having me back. Oh, um, well, this weekend uh, you just released uh, some pretty groundbreaking information about the Robert F. Kennedy case. You did a presentation at the JFK Lancer in Dallas about it, and you've put the information out on the Internet, too. And with this video, I'm going to have some links uh, to your articles so people can see this for themselves. But I'm glad you're able to come on here and <laughs> give people a little bit of a brief overview because it's some real interesting developments in the RFK case. Well, thanks. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm hoping that... Uh it can lead to some more advancement in the case, and I, yeah, I definitely think it's it's new connections and new information that should have been released to the public a long time ago, but unfortunately officials didn't want people to see all this. Uh, so I'm trying to, I want to think of the best way to, to coin this for everybody so we can summarize it. Uh, basically. As you know, Mike, the historical discussion regarding the assassination conspiracy for Senator Kennedy has been, you know, subject to 50 years of debate. Indeed, several witnesses, ballistics inconsistencies noted by the Los Angeles Coroner's Office, and Sirhan's firing position, you know, all those things support Sirhan Bashar Sirhan did not fire the killing shots. However, like the coroner's did, report, where the bullets are coming from, and how many yeah. bullets, all this stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The autopsy it, report. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, the autopsy report basically states that uh, the person who delivered the killing shots to Senator Kennedy would have had to have been directly behind him, and the final shot behind the ear had to be two inches or less because it left powder marks on the back of his skin. So that precludes Sirhan because every witness except for one said he was three feet or more away, or two feet or more away, and his arm isn't over two feet long, and it doesn't bend around the back of Senator Kennedy's head, so he couldn't have fired those shots. But he did have a gun, and he was And he was going fired. Crazy. That, yeah, yeah that, he that's was the firing, thing yeah. that everybody, yeah, that supports your hand has to remember as well, though, is mm -hmm. that, you know, he did at the very least fire several shots into a crowded room full of people that struck multiple victims, and that would have constituted several cases of attempted murder. So he's not innocent of all crimes. He just, based on the forensic and uh, the ballistics data that we have, couldn't have committed the one crime of killing Robert F. Kennedy, according to that evidence. So in both those instances, though, neither side has been able to amass definitive evidence proving what actually occurred, because the Los Angeles police destroyed thousands of pieces of evidence before Sirhan had an appeal. So, despite all these questionable occurrences, though, no blatant evidence of a nefarious conspiracy has yet surfaced. But you've been looking at some of these police files <laughs> and found something very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, most, yeah, you know, I mean, well, a lot of people who look at this case focus on the tragic events of the ambassador and the aftermath, which is what I did when I first looked at them, too, uh, when I wrote my first book. But I decided to start at the beginning again and to seek out people who might have influenced or aided the later attack with Sirhan. Now, this wouldn't reveal the unknown alleged other shooter, nor would it prove a greater political conspiracy. But if it could be established that Sirhan had direct aid before the attack, it would establish a plot as well. And this wouldn't be the answer to a majority of all the outstanding questions, but it would reveal a criminal conspiracy. And as I'm sure most are familiar, you know, with, with the legal references using the guides of motive, means, and opportunity to determine the basic elements of a crime required for the proper investigation of a suspect. You know, we've all seen that on TV and other places and in legal briefings, even in legal guidebooks. I've read them, you know, in law books where they discuss those are primary important factors when you're investigating the suspect. Now, 
According to the Los Angeles Police Department and the District Attorney's Office, Sirhan Sirhan possessed motive, means, and opportunity to assassinate Senator Kennedy without aid. In this instance, means is the point of contention that I have because Sirhan did not acquire the alleged murder weapon by himself. Now, unmentioned by officials in later charges is the person who set up the alleged murder weapons illegal sale, purchased the gun, provided a majority of money for the weapon, and then decided to give it to Sirhan, knowing that Sirhan's claim of wanting it for target practice was not true. In the, the files that you, that, you know, you, you showed me the files uh, that you found, and what they are are meetings with the prosecutors and officials about the case before they're going to court. Uh, and analyze, they're analyzing the evidence, you know, and talking about it. So, so they're naming this person you're, you're talking about, even whether they should do a case against them. Yeah, yeah. His name is Munir Bishara Salome Sirhan. He is the brother of the alleged assassin. Now, in one police interview, Munir states, quote, Well, I don't know he didn't, well, I know he didn't want it for a rifle range, referring to the gun. So he's saying that he knows that the reason Sirhan gave him to get him the gun is not true. He offered the day before the crime that he regretted buying the weapon to a co-worker, and he described Sirhan to the witnesses and the police the next day that he was convinced of his brother's guilt, and that Sirhan was violent, unstable, anti-Israel, and anti-Kennedy. He originally tells the police that Sirhan purchased the gun, and his brother was alone responsible for everything, and he was a mere spectator in these events. Officials determined that Munir lied to prevent himself from being charged with a felony, another legal infraction, which would be obstructing justice by lying to them. And unknown to many, he was facing deportation because of a prior narcotics charge before he acquired the alleged murder weapon. They state in one related document, quote, when the investigation into the history of the murder weapon established that Munir Sirhan had purchased the gun from George Erhard, the possibility of a conspiracy between Sirhan and his brother was raised. The investigation had determined that Munir Sirhan had arranged for the purchase. When first interviewed, Munir Sirhan denied that he purchased the gun. He contended instead that he had only been present when the gun was purchased by Sirhan. Such an admission would have placed him in the position of having committed a felony. So, it's true that officials could not establish a nefarious conspiracy where Munir and Sirhan together with others planned every part of the crime. However, they could establish he illegally purchased the weapon and provided it to the alleged assassin, and these elements are required for the crime to occur. And that is sort of like being an accessory before the fact, wouldn't it be? Yeah. And depending on if they charged him for the obstruction, the accessory after the fact. I mean, I know ca cases where I live where if somebody uh, g sells someone uh, a, an illegal drug and the person dies, then they're liable for doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, so to me, this sounds very similar. Like, you know, I know if, if I have um, an illegal weapon, an illegal gun in my possession – and I give it to somebody, uh, say it's a stolen gun, and then I'd, I'd sell it to someone else, that's against, and they shoot someone, I'm in trouble. You're right. Yeah, so, yeah so, you're liable. Yeah, I, I, so this to me sounds, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but it's, it sounds <laughs> like a similar type of legal situation. Well, I, I am consulting with a couple lawyers, as you know, <laughs> and they don't disagree. <laughs> I, but once again, I'm not saying making any sort of legal charge. I'm not alleging anything more than the evidence says itself. I am merely restating what the evidence says and what the law is. And it appears that they ignored that for reasons that we'll discuss soon. Um, I, I think, you know, it's also important now that's, you know, people at this point might say, well, you know, it's not like we actually have the guy admitting it. Well, I would ask you to give me a few minutes. In another interview with officials, 
Munir discusses his role in the matter and is told by an official that Sirhan could not have committed the crime without Munir's assistance, and Sirhan's brother disputes this. Munir accurately claims that Sirhan could have acquired another gun, but the official counters Sirhan would not have the specific gun in evidence without Munir providing it, and Munir replies, quote, Oh, that gun, yeah, that's right. Munir Sirhan further admits, quote, I thought me, you know, being involved, I felt guilty. Without me, he wouldn't have been able to get the gun. Well, who do you make that last statement to? to the Los uh, Angeles Police Department. Okay, right. And it, during an, an interrogation type interview? or Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, privately... What many people probably don't know is the LAPD wanted to prosecute Munir Sirhan for his role in the crime, and the U.S. Department of Immigration wanted to deport him. The L.A. District Attorney's Office was aware of the ongoing deportation proceedings as police conducted their investigation. In fact, officials were so confident of the charges, they stated establishing a, quote, prima facie case against him. Prima facie is a legal term designating cases that will lead to an indictment against a suspect unless the defense produces substantial contending evidence. Yet despite the admissions and substantial evidence, the Los Angeles DA did nothing. The documents verify... Why? Oh, I'm sorry, why? go ahead. Oh, well, why, why? Why do you think they did nothing? Well, personally, I, I would contend the primary reason was to secure the voluntary guilty plea of Sirhan Sirhan and to protect their predetermination of no criminal conspiracy having occurred despite the evidence. If officials charged Munir, Sirhan likely would have reversed his plea and used every defense he could to fight the charges and protect his brother. Mm. So he already pled guilty. Yeah. And, but he and could by the time it. this is happening, right, or get, in, get new lawyers, get fight. Yep. His whole family might fight, too. Well, and his whole family would have... That was one of the things the police referred to in their documents, was they didn't want to cut off the rapport with the members of the family that would still talk to them. Oh, okay. So they're still getting cooperation. And cooperation that might continue forever. Exactly. And, you know, Especially that... to protect another member of the family. Mm. <laughs> well, it's <laughs> pretty... I mean, it's a pretty amazing stuff, because... I mean, I've only read a couple books about the RFK assassination over the years, and you know, none of them touch on anything like this at all. Well, I think the thing is, is that you know, you had unfortunately not by the intent of the advocates, but I think we had the police and, in some ways, uh, some researchers keeping this information. You know, not necessarily that they knew about it, but they weren't looking for it because mm -hmm. it would implicate another member of Sirhan's family. So I think that that would sort of agree that Sirhan was guilty in some way, so that never was on the agenda. And officials, of course, didn't want this found out because it shows that they didn't do their jobs. They had all the evidence for a great case, and they threw it away because they wanted to secure the conviction of Sirhan. And while that might not be, it might not be illegal for them to have done it, it was wholly unethical. And it wholly was done out of hubris, trying to protect their case to the public. They didn't want a conspiracy to have happened. This needed to be one guy, and it needed to go away. And so they decided that they were just going to destroy as much evidence as they could and then hope no one ever found that. Ned, when you talk of you know, a, a conspiracy involving uh, these two people, you're not you don't mean in the assassination but in the purchase of the weapon, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. it's it, Munir doesn't have to necessarily know what Sirhan was going to do with the weapon to make all right. this conspiracy. It's a criminal conspiracy as soon as somebody who is already under charges knowingly arranges an illegal gun sale and then gives the weapon to somebody who he knows lied to him about what it's for and later on says that the guy's violent and anti-Israel and anti-Kennedy and basically tries to blame everything on him knowing that he had a role in it. Mm. 
Well, I, <laughs> it's, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's amazing how this is, you know, the, well, let me ask you this about those files. Um, how long have they been out there? In since, no, uh, since they released them in the 80s, late in 80s. The, in the late 80s. So, so, yeah, so this information has just been, you know, well, sitting if, there for, yeah. for that long, and you, you, you're the first person to really uncover it. I guess it's just that people aren't digging that deep enough. Well, I wouldn't say that. I don't want to – I don't think this was an intent – I think that there are a lot of people who are digging real deep. I just don't think that – you know, it's also – Yeah, I think it's so it's, much it's, stuff it's to look number, at. Yeah, it's a number of things. It's just so yeah. much material plus – and I'm not saying that everybody is digging super deep. I'm not saying that either. <laughs> but I think there are a number of good people, you know, that we know and that are out there that are that are doing good work and digging in the areas that just always seem to be, you know, they, they didn't turn up anything. And it just so happens that, you know, I decided to restart again. And as I went through reading page by page, I happened to hit upon a few things. You know, I, I, I think I had talked to you about this and Chuck O'Telly and some other people that it had always I had always wondered why nothing was done about the weapon. Why mm. why Munir was never brought up by the police. I'm like, you know, maybe they just didn't have enough evidence. And then I found all the evidence they had. And I found them saying that they had a prima facie case against him. And then I had to consider why would they throw away Oh, that's why. Because they could risk the main defendant. If the main defendant turned on them, they had no case. So it didn't matter what they had against Munir. So they needed to throw everything at Sirhan, make the Munir thing go away, to say this was a lone man, and then, and like I said, this doesn't prove some grand nefarious conspiracy, but it does prove a feasible conspiracy, a criminal one happened. But it was one that hurt their case so they needed it to go away. Well, it's and, one that we can see, too. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's, see, that's what I think is the most important thing. We can verify this happened. This is their words. This is Munir's words himself. I'm not, we're not speculating about anything. You can go to the links. You can look at the documents yourself. And if you like it, please like the video and support us in the comments. Yeah, get the information out there. That's what we're all about. Is you know, if you're digging stuff up. It's it's pretty amazing, and you're just starting, really. Or, well, yeah, gotta... and we're gonna put this in. You know, hopefully, we're, we're there's gonna be an upcoming book uh, that I'm going to put this in. But I wanted the public to get it first, mm -hmm. and I will expound more in the book. There's more information, of course, and there's more details. But I am more interested in people being able to see the the vital documents, so they can see that this isn't. Just another, you know, because we've all had, to, I'm sure, come across people saying they've proven the conspiracy, and they haven't. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying I have. I'm not saying I have proven the ult the ultimate conspiracy of nefarity that people are looking for. But the evidence here infers the police did not tell us all the facts. They had another person that they should have prosecuted, which they didn't. And now I want to know why, and I think we all should know why. Why? Did they hide this? Why were they not honest? And what are they going to do about it now to try to correct the historical record? Well, that'll be interesting to see how, how they, <laughs> if we get any reaction from them, thinking, that'll be very interesting. A lot of nothing. <laughs> well, we'll see. You never know. But, uh, <laughs> but as long as people know the questions are out there, that's a start, too. Uh, so, well, thanks for taking the time to talk with me, and uh, I'll have a link uh, to, uh, a, you know, where people can go read your article about this and, and see this, and you're going to be on the Chuck Ocelli show, too, uh, in a couple of days, uh, Thursday, I think, talking about this in much more detail, so thanks. And yeah, yeah, a, yeah, no, yeah, I'll be there, um, I believe, the, yeah, the 22nd. Okay. Well, so, I'll, I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully, we'll get you there, too, and we can all talk about it. Okay, looking forward to it. Well, have a good night. You too, Mike. Thanks.